it up? All right, so we're in a series called That's a Good Question. That's a good question. And we've been looking at different questions that have been brought forth from the scriptures to other people in the Bible. And today's one of my favorites because today's question comes in the midst of an extended Bible story. And I love telling Old Testament Bible stories. Do you like Old Testament stories? Do you? I do. I find them fascinating. I love to, to review them. I can go over them many, many times. And I get something different every time I look at them. You know? And so we're going to look at maybe for some a familiar story. But what I have learned is never assume it's familiar to everybody. I mean, sometimes it's the first time that somebody heard that story. So we have to take a little time every time we do this to be sure we're all on board. So anyway, today's question begins with this thought. This is a challenging time of year for many people. It's a challenging season for a lot of people right now. I went to the, the uh, 76 station over there by uh, Walgreens the other day to fill up my car with gas. Like you, I'm on a limited income, right? I don't have money pouring down the chimney into my house. So I went to the 76 station. I had my little black Audi out. It's not little. It's a big black Audi. And I pulled up there, and I had uh, an eighth of a tank in my Audi. And so I pulled up, and I stuck the thing in there, and started pumping. And my Audi uses premium only because it's one of those kind of cars. $98.90 later to fill it up. $98. I said, who moved the decimal? What in the world? It's challenging financially right now. I mean, homes are selling for $800,000, $850,000, a million dollars all over town. The high cost of living is no joke, amen? I mean, that's challenging. At the uh, men's, uh, not the men's, but the uh, barbecue we had last week, Father's Day barbecue, you guys just saw I had little candy bars that I was giving out. So I went to Hagen to get these candy bars. I got my hair cut, looks good. Walked down to Hagen to get the candy bars, try to, you know, get two things done at once. I walk in there. How much is a candy bar supposed to cost? You know, big ones. Two for six dollars. Five ninety nine for two. I just about fell over. I thought I'm going to buy fifty dollars worth of candy bars. How in the world? When did that happen? I should have gone to the dollars. Of course, they'd have been this thick, but that's uh, that's another thing. The cost of living is a challenge. Gas is a challenge. Rent is a challenge. Public schools, don't get me started. It's a challenge. If you don't have kids in school, you don't probably don't get it. But if you do, you do get it. It's a challenge. It's a challenge in our political realm right now. Again, I don't want to be, I'm not running for office. I'm not going to go down that road. But it does seem like I could say we seem to have some problems with corruption these days. We see violence, war. Did you follow the Russia thing yesterday? Talk about scary. It seems like all around us, immorality is being paraded about like it's something cool. It's challenging times. Church, I got to tell you something. Just, I just about lost my lunch in my, my Audi, which would not be good. I was going past Lundin down here yesterday. And it was about uh, 11.30 noon, something like that. And right there along the fence, on the road right there, a whole line of gay pride flags and two gay pride clowns. I knew that because they had gay pride colors on and clown things and and they're standing there with crowds of kids handing out the flags. Targeting children with their beliefs. I've I, I got to be careful. I'll get a hate speech check here if I'm not careful. Do you still love me if I get a hate speech check? Okay. Sometimes it just seems like 
It's a tough time to be alive. And there are times when we think as Christians that we're losing the battle. It seems like we're the underdogs. It's, you know what an underdog is? Somebody said they don't know what an underdog is. I thought, okay, got to explain that. Underdog is a person who's not favored to win. The one who's, you know, the one who doesn't have the money, the speed, the, the reflexes. The underdog is the one everybody says they don't got a chance. And sometimes it feels like the church, the big church, not just, uh, you know, the big church, like we're the underdogs. And we're facing a Goliath of issues before us. And it's easy to lose hope. Somebody say amen. It's easy to lose hope. You, you, when I drove by Lundin Park and I saw those clowns, I, literally clowns, I mean, passing out pride flags to little children. My goodness gracious. That's another sermon for another day. Remind me, Boyd, I'll preach that sermon another day. That's not what we're about today. When I'm here today, and I got 40 minutes with half an hour to go, what we're here about today is for me to encourage you. Turn to your neighbor and see, say, be encouraged. Be encouraged. I want to encourage you today. Church, no matter how it might look out there, the story isn't done. There is hope. There is hope out there. Don't give in to the despair. Don't give in to the cynicism. Don't crawl into a little hole and pull the top over, like they did in those cartoons when we were kids. Don't crawl into a hole and pull the lid over your life and say, I wash my hands of it. Don't do that. Let's understand. There's hope in Christ. The underdog will prevail. That's us. Romans 15, 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Church, we serve a God of hope. Doesn't matter if you're not the smartest or the strongest or the richest or the best looking. God loves the underdog. He loves your family. He loves you. Have hope. When you've been around the block a few times, which I can say now, I have seen how when it looks dark, that's when God comes in. And we're going to see our hope one day. We are going to see, here you go, our blessed hope one day. Jesus is the blessed hope. One of these days, he's coming back. And when that day happens, you and me, Alicia, we're flying away. And everything will be set right. But until then, sometimes times look dark. Sometimes we feel like the underdog. And today's, that's a great question, comes from a classic underdog. All right? So we're going to look at an Old Testament story, and uh, we'll move quickly through because I know it's familiar. But we're going to turn in your Bibles to the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus. And we're going to walk through the story very quickly of Moses versus Pharaoh. Moses versus Pharaoh and talk about one of the great underdog stories of all time with Moses. Now, for those who don't know, and I, again, I won't assume everybody does, Moses would have been a Hebrew. We call him, we'd say a Jew. Pharaoh was an Egyptian, uh, king of Egypt. Pharaoh was a title that meant the king of Egypt. And the date of the story is 1,400 years before Christ. That's a long time. 1,400 years before Christ. Long time before Jesus. That's even longer than Chuck Wolf was alive. 1,400 years. Sorry, Chuck. Just to remember, we've got to have a little context. Remember the situation. The Jewish tribe, and we'll use the word tribe because that's really what they were back in those days. The Jewish tribe had moved from the north to the south into Egypt 
because of a famine that had hit the land. And so they had moved down to Egypt where Joseph had come to power. That whole story of Joseph is one you got to review in the book of Genesis. Joseph was a Jew who had been sold into slavery, went down to Egypt and prospered. Came to power down there. And he, he was wise enough to save food in the good days so they'd have food in a drought. And so when the drought hit, the entire tribe moved down to Egypt where there was food. And they did well in Egypt. The Jews did well down there. They flourished in Egypt. But Joseph died. The Pharaoh who knew Joseph died. And things turned against the Jews. This is a very quick synopsis. Things went downhill for the Jews very quickly. The Jews became slaves in Egypt. They worked in the fields. They worked to build the cities of Pharaoh. Life was hard for slaves. They didn't have a seventh day off. They didn't have a Saturday off. They worked every day. And when you're a slave, you can't vote. There's no constitution. There's no union. No protesting allowed. No appeals court. You just did what you were told. And that was the situation that the Jews were in. Pharaoh, as king, was the absolute monarch. Now, it's hard for us to even imagine that because we don't have anything like that really in the world today. But Pharaoh was seen as God. God incarnate. We're going to talk about the Egyptian gods here in just a little bit. But he was God incarnate. And he could do anything he want at all. So if he didn't like to look at you, he'd kill you. He could take any life, any time. He was one of the most powerful men in the world, Pharaoh. And the Jewish population started to grow too fast. Now, in chapter 1, you can see on verse 22, 1 and 22, Pharaoh looked out over the Jewish portions of his cities and saw that very quickly, the slaves were outnumbering the Egyptians. And pretty soon, Pharaoh was a smart enough man to go, wait a minute, there's more of them than there's us. And this is not a good situation. And if you think that's far-fetched, we had such a situation in the South once upon a time when there were more slaves than there were slaveholders. And they were concerned in the South in those days as Pharaoh was in the story. So he gave an order in 122. He, he commanded all his people saying, every son who is born you shall cast into the river and every daughter you shall save alive. He ordered genocide. He ordered the children to be killed. Take the little boys, kill them. Genocide, an absolute ruler who could kill those Jewish boys. How many of you would agree this is not a good guy? This is an evil man. But he gives that order. He says, cast them into the river. Purely a political move to make sure that the uh, Israelites didn't become stronger than the Egyptians. Into this situation, can you imagine the tears the weeping from the families as their sons are being tossed to drown into the river. Could you even stand to look at that? Could you stand it to watch these people do that to your family? But that's what they did. And in the midst of all of this, though, God begins to work. And this is what I want you to see. In the midst of these difficult times, genocide, slavery, God had a plan. God was watching. God knew what was going on and began to prepare a leader. In chapter 2, verse 1, let's read this. I'm going to go quickly. It says, A man in the house of Levi went and took his wife, a daughter of Levi. So the woman conceived and bore a son. 
And when she saw that he was a beautiful child, she hid him three months. What was going to happen to boys in Egypt? What was this boy's fate? He would be thrown in a river, amen? And she knew it. Hid him for three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him, daubed it with asphalt and pitch, and put the child in it, laid it in the reeds by the riverbank. And his sister stood afar off to know what would be done to him. Then the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, and her maidens walked along the riverside. And when they saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. And when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby wept. So she had a compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the maiden went and called the child's mother. Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. And the child grew and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became a son. So she called his name Moses, saying, Because I drew him out of the water. It's a fabulous little story right there. Remember the commandment was to toss the boys in the river, to drown them. So she kind of puts a twist on that, puts them in a little basket, and floats them in the river, trusting to Almighty God. And then with the circumstances, nobody could have guessed but God, Pharaoh's daughter takes this little baby and then gives him back to his mother to nurse him. Praise God for that. That's amazing. And then when the time has come, they bring this little boy, Moses, into Pharaoh's courtyard. Now, you've got to understand what that meant. God is preparing somebody who looks like an underdog to become the one who's going to lead his people to victory. Pharaoh's court. That would have meant Pharaoh's training. Pharaoh's food. It would have meant that he'd had the very best of education. The very best of physical exercise. It would have meant he'd learned how to use a sword and a spear. He'd know how to ride a horse and drive a carriage. He would have been educated in the best education possible. This is a Jew. Let me tell you something. You think God can't work in your life? Look at this. Look at this example. Anyway, make a long story short. What happens is Moses kills an Egyptian who was abusing a Jew. And so they drive Moses out of Egypt, into the desert. He goes to the land of Midian. When he gets to Midian, he meets some shepherds, a family there, and he begins to start a second career. Anybody here start a second career? Moses does. He adapts. He rolls with the blows, and he decides, I'm going to be a shepherd. So living out in Midian, he decides he's going to become a shepherd. Now, was it God's plan for him to be a shepherd? Maybe, you know, but God's ultimate plan for him was to deliver his people. But there was a season in the desert. There was a season when he wasn't doing exactly what God had planned. It was a season of preparation. Somebody say amen. See, some of you guys are in a season of preparation. You're in a time. When God is preparing you, he's training you for what he has for you down the road. See, what God knew that they couldn't possibly know is that one day soon, Moses would be leading somewhere over a million people out into those very same deserts to go to the promised land. And in his years of shepherding, he learned how to find water. He learned where to find food. He learned how to navigate out in the desert. He learned all of that as a shepherd. So God prepared him. Even in the midst of hard times, God prepared him. Chapter 3, verse 7. 
We're almost done. Hang in with guys. Chapter 3, verse 7. God speaks finally to Moses. And I want you to see what God says to Moses because I want you to leave this morning having hope. God speaks to Moses. He calls Moses out of the desert, out of the shepherding. He calls him to go back to face Pharaoh. And this is what he says. Listen now. The person who feels like an underdog. You feel like you're losing. You're feeling hopeless. Listen. The Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. And I've heard their cry because of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows. So I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. And to bring them up from that land to a good and large land. To a land flowing with milk and honey. To the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hevites, the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold. The cry of the children of Israel has come to me. I've also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Church, that little reading tells you everything you need to know about the God you serve. Especially if you're going through difficult times. Notice what it says. It says, I have seen what's going on. He sees your life. He sees what you're going through. He's, he's not blind to your issues. He sees it. It says, I have heard their prayers. Sometimes in our humanity, we wonder, what, is God deaf? Can he not hear me when I pray? Church, listen. He hears. He hears, he saw, he heard. He said, I know their sorrows. He knows their sorrows. He knows our sorrows. And it says, I have come down to free them. I love that about our God. I love that he is in our life, that he's watching, listening, interactive, and that he's taken and making changes in our life so we can overcome. Now, it's interesting how Moses responds. And this is the great question. It took us this long to get here. Here's the great question. 311. God speaks to Moses. And then chapter 3, verse 11, Moses responds with the big question. Moses said to God, boy, that's something right there. <laughs> Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Then Moses says to the Lord in 410, oh, my Lord, I'm not eloquent Neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Moses says to God the question, Who am I to do this? Who am I to do this? You know what he's thinking, don't you? He's thinking, I'm just a shepherd. This is a big job, church. Do you get it? This isn't Charlton Heston in Hollywood. This is a big job. He's being told by Almighty God, you, Moses, you are going to go all the way back across the desert to Egypt. When you get to Egypt, you're going to look in the face of the most powerful man in the world, Pharaoh, and you're going to tell him, let over a million slaves go free. No problem. And Pharaoh's just thinking, who, who me? Who am I? How many can resonate with Moses? Just about all of us can. We would say the same thing. We got, who, me? Who am I? He goes on and says, I, I, don't, I'm, I don't speak so good. I'm not a public speaker. How am I going to do this? 
course, God's answer is this in 4.11. Who has made man's mouth? Who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, the blind? Have I not the Lord? He's telling him, Moses, it's not who you are. Get this. It's who I am. It's not about you. It's about me. It doesn't matter your weaknesses. I will make you strong. It doesn't matter. You ain't got no army. You haven't got any chariots. You haven't got any money. You got kicked out of that place once upon a time. That doesn't matter. What matters is God. When God calls, God equips. When God sends you, he goes with you. So even if you're the biggest underdog in the world, if God sends you on a mission, he'll be with you. And Moses was feeling like quite the underdog in that moment. I guess I want to speak to the underdogs in the room. I got just a couple minutes. We all know how the story ends, right? Do we? Moses goes back to Egypt, confronts Pharaoh. There's a series of 10 plagues. And after the 10 plagues, Pharaoh finally says, take and go. Get out of here. Take your people. Get out of this. And he leads them across the desert to the banks of the, of the Jordan River. At the end of the story, the underdog wins. Moses wins. The people are set free. Moses said this. He said, who am I? And God said back to him, you are the servant of the Most High God. Mom, at times you're feeling overwhelmed. How do you deal with those kids in the summer? God will be there with you. Dad, you're wondering, how can I stand another day at this ridiculous job? God will be with you. Church, you're feeling like an underdog. You're feeling like you're the least of the people here. Listen, God will be with you. God is a God of hope. Who are you? You can lift your chin up and you can look to the heavens and the answer is, I am a child of God. That's who I am. And devil, you better take a run because I'm coming out on top. I know there's some folks who have a pessimistic view of life. Kind of like Eeyore and Winnie the Pooh. You ask them, how are you doing? Their response is, well, okay for the day. Not too bad. Sort of all right. They'll say something like, I'm not bad under the circumstances. My response is always, what are you doing under there? We are called to live above the circumstances. The God of hope is our God. All right, it's time to pray. I want to pray for the person today who's feeling like an underdog. There's no shame in that. I want to pray for the person who's feeling like there's just so much going on. There's so much happening. I don't, I don't know that I can do this. The person who's feeling physically like an underdog, maybe an illness, a doctor's prognosis, as you're feeling like an underdog. There was a time I would have said I was feeling like an underdog because I just couldn't seem to get this prodigal kid on the right track. And it felt like the powers of hell were just against me. It was a difficult time. I felt like an underdog. Here's the thing. We want to pray for you and allow the Holy Spirit to work in you. So church, why don't you stand? Aldina, why don't you come to the piano? People in the balcony, this is for you too. All I'm going to ask you to do is just come here to the front. I'm going to anoint you with oil. We'll have some others gather around you. We're not going to ask the details of what's going on. 
but we don't, you want to say, I need God. I'm feeling like the underdog in this situation. And I need God to undertake in my life. I need that grandchild saved. I need my health restored. I need financial blessing. I need a place to live. God, help me. I'm the underdog. We want to pray for you. Who will be the first? Let's go ahead. Let's come to the front, and we're going to pray for you. Come on up. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Come right on up, and we're going to pray for you. We're going to believe for God to work. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Let's have... uh, some of our board, some of our prayer people. Ace, why don't you come on over and pray? And Mark and Lottie, others come forward. Folks in the balcony, we'll wait. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Denise, will you come pray with Alicia? Thank you, Jesus. Now, church, begin to pray for those that are here. I'm going to anoint them with oil. for those that are in front of you. Hallelujah. Church, extend your hands this way. Heavenly Father, we are encouraged by the story of Moses that teaches us once again that nothing's too hard for you, that even the underdogs can prevail with your hand in their life. So, Lord Jesus, we come before you and pray in agreement for those who have responded here this morning. Lord, you know the stories for each one. You know the situation that's unique for each one. And Lord Jesus, I pray that as you were with Moses and led him to victory, God, you'd lead them to victory over their circumstances, Lord. (laughs) Lord, I pray for the children to be saved, finances to be provided, for the health challenges to be overcome. Lord, that we would give testimony that you are a great and mighty God. Lord, we know you're a friend to the underdog, friend to the helpless. And Jesus, 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 provide for their every need in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. <coughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We're just waiting on the Lord. We're just taking a moment. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. The Spirit of God is moving. Church, press in. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. who've come down here. Listen, this week you've got to walk in your victory. You've got to remember who am I? I am a child of God. Amen? Don't let the devil persuade you otherwise. Don't let him steal your victory. You are a child of God, child of the living God. Remember that? Underdogs will overcome in Jesus. Amen, church? Amen. Amen and amen. Those of you who came forward, thank you. You can go back to your seats. And church, we want to remind you to stick around and have some coffee with us, maybe some cookies. <coughs> thank you, Lord. I'll be right down here if somebody wants to uh, speak with me, you had something you want to prayer or something like that. Happy to do that. All right. Praise the Lord. Praise God. All right, you ready for a benediction? All right, let's receive a blessing from the Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you that you're a friend of the underdog and the story is still being told of 
about our culture and our country. Lord, we believe, we believe that you're going to do a miracle. Lord, thank you for everyone here today. Continue to do your work, Lord. Continue to build your church. Lord, we pray this in the name of Jesus. Watch over us as we go. Let your spirit guide us all week long in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Hey, greet somebody as you're going out. Give somebody a hug or a handshake. Thanks for coming. Praise the Lord.